Milwaukee with VOA's Middle East Monitor. Coming up, the U.S. marks the end of its military mission in Iraq. A U.S. congressional panel looks for ways to help the Syrian opposition. When the regime is gone, the Syrian people can be assured that they will have plenty of help in rebuilding and reforming their state. Human Rights Watch has a new report on who is responsible in Syria. And we'll continue our series on Yemen transitioning to democracy. It's all ahead on The Voice of America. The United States has marked the end of its Iraqi military mission with a special ceremony in Baghdad. U.S. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta spoke, calling it a historic occasion for both the Iraqi and American people. This outcome was never certain, especially during the war's darkest days. In 2006, as a member of President Bush's Iraq study group, I traveled here at a time when sectarian violence was skyrocketing, and it seemed as if nothing was working. Iraq was struggling with turmoil, with violence, with uncertainty. And today, some five years later, and after a great deal of blood has been spilled by both Iraqis and Americans, the mission of an Iraq that could finally govern and secure itself has become real. U.S. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Correspondent Luis Ramirez is traveling with the Secretary. VOA's Paul Westphaling spoke with him from Baghdad. Here in Baghdad, just uh, a short moment ago, there was a ceremony marking the end of Operation New Dawn. That's the end of the uh, military operation in this country. Uh, from here on, uh, the uh, job at hand is for the U.S. military to uh, pull out the remaining few thousand uh, troops that are still on the soil here. Um, Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta uh, came here to the ceremony, uh, called this a historic moment, um, and uh, thanked uh, the troops for their sacrifices, which he said were not in vain. Now, this uh, is coming about two weeks from uh, when the U.S. is going to be pulling out all of its troops from Iraq. Could you paint a word picture for us? Uh, what's it like there? It must be uh, anticipation of going home and yet some regret maybe leaving Iraq uh, with a job that's not completely done. Well, this has been a, a huge operation over the last few weeks. Pretty much uh, the, the bulk of, of the troops uh, are, are already uh, out of here. Uh, millions of pieces of equipment also out of here, uh, making their way down to the, the uh, Kuwaiti border. The U.S. base is in Kuwait. This has uh, been a, a tremendous operation. In a matter of weeks, uh, some 50,000 troops uh, have, have, have been pulled out with, like I mentioned, uh, millions of pieces uh, of equipment. Uh, in interviewing the uh, soldiers, I was, uh, I've been uh, following them uh, all the way from homecoming ceremonies in the United States to uh, that uh, uh, transition bases, the transition bases in Kuwait and uh, here on the ground in Baghdad. And uh, what I'm getting is an overall sense of relief that uh, they are going home, but also concerns that uh, a job that has taken eight years to do and uh, cost more than 4,000 American lives, 30,000 wounded, uh, is leaving behind a situation that is not entirely stable. Now, uh, Secretary Panetta did point out uh, the uh, milestones that were reached here. Uh, number one, Saddam Hussein uh, was removed from power. Um, after that, uh, the country slipped into uh, uh, sectarian violence. And, uh, and uh, after following the surge uh, of troops years ago, uh, that situation has greatly improved. But that said, there are still incidents of violence. Uh, there is the threat of intervention on the part of Iran, which has been supporting extremists in, in this country and has been behind uh, recent attacks. Uh, all of that uh, threat is very much still there, and there is some concern. Uh, what U.S. officials are saying is that it is now uh, in the hands of, uh, of the Iraqis uh, to see what direction they want to guide their country in. Well, we must uh, tell everyone that you are on a trip with the Secretary of Defense. Yesterday, Wednesday, he was in eastern Afghanistan. Could you briefly summarize what he said there? Well, he uh, pointed to great progress that the U.S. military has made in, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, virtually about 50 percent of the country uh, has now been handed over to Afghan security forces. 
uh, that that is uh, great progress. Uh, considering that uh, the, the end goal is for the, the uh, Afghan forces to be able to protect and secure their own country and that the U.S. can eventually draw, uh, draw down uh, the drawdown, of course, expected uh, in 2014 in that country. Uh, there is still an area of concern uh, along uh, the eastern part of Afghanistan. Uh, that, uh, the efforts there are complicated by deteriorating relations with Pakistan. Correspondent Luis Ramirez speaking with us from Baghdad. <music> President Barack Obama has thanked American forces who served in the nearly nine-year-long conflict in Iraq. VOA's Ken Klein reports from the White House. The president visited Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to welcome returning troops and express the country's gratitude. So as your commander-in-chief, and on behalf of a grateful nation, I'm proud to finally say these two words, and I know your families agree. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Special Forces soldiers from Fort Bragg were among the first to enter Iraq in the 2003 invasion. The base is also home to several units of paratroopers who helped to lead the troop increase in Iraq in 2007. Mr. Obama recognized the sacrifices made by U.S. service members in Iraq. More than 1.5 million Americans have served in Iraq. 1.5 million. Over 30,000 Americans have been wounded. And those are only the wounds that show. Nearly 4,500 Americans made the ultimate sacrifice. The last U.S. troops are to leave Iraq by December 31st, although Mr. Obama has pledged to support Iraq as it works to establish a democratic government in a dangerous region. The president called the results of the war an extraordinary achievement. Now, Iraq's not a perfect place. It has many challenges ahead. But we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable and self-reliant Iraq with a representative government that was elected by its people. The president told the troops that he could not be prouder of them and that the nation could not be prouder of them. The war in Iraq will soon belong to history. Your service belongs to the ages. Mr. Obama has made numerous visits to North Carolina, which is seen as an important state in his 2012 re-election campaign. The state's largest city, Charlotte, will host the Democratic National Convention in September. One of the leading Republican presidential contenders, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, sent a letter to a newspaper based near Fort Bragg criticizing the high unemployment rate among veterans. Mr. Obama and his wife Michelle told the soldiers at Fort Bragg they're working to ensure that returning veterans will receive jobs and needed medical care. Kent Klein, VOA News, the White House. An Iraqi road south to Kuwait has been a hotbed of anti-American violence, roadside bombs, and assaults by insurgents. Teams like Minnesota's 1st Platoon A Company to 135 Infantry are clearing the last stretch of highway of threats to exiting convoys. Arash Arabasadi traveled into Iraq with U.S. troops. It's just another day for the men assigned to protect American convoys leaving Iraq. Troops, trucks, and cargo traveled the main supply route into Kuwait, mostly without incident, because of soldiers like these. Our task is to do a patrol. The purpose is to not only clear the route, but also to deter threats if there were enemy activity on that route for convoys moving north and south. They are called CSTs, or Convoy Security Teams, and it's units like this one that ride in the military's heavily armored, IED-defeating Cayman truck. They travel north from Kuwait to the Iraq border, the K-crossing, where they receive their mission briefing, assemble their 50 caliber turret-mounted machine guns, and head out into the desert. It's not long before the security team experiences radio troubles. We can hear truck three, but truck three can't hear us. So they stop, all of them. Out here in the desert, groups like this must work together to survive in the vast emptiness of southern Iraq, because usually, Nothing good waits for them. There was a vehicle trailing us with their lights on. When we started slowing down, they stopped, turned their lights off, and did a U-turn. 
and A Company followed. So for every situation, we have the, the correct practice reaction. The vehicle is not a threat, and the team rendezvous with one of the last convoys passing three rock to provide safe passage to Kuwait. That's our, that's our duty. We're infantrymen. Tonight was easy. Tonight was a 10-hour event. Quick, get in, get out support the convoys that are moving north and south. This is my job, this is what I signed up to do, and whether I like it or not, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it right. Specialist Sean Raleigh was here in 2003 at the onset of the U.S. invasion. And now he's here in its final days. A lot happened in between the beginning and now, but coming in and like kind of, I guess, closing the door is, it's definitely, I think the biggest reality check was I swore that I'd never come back here, <laughs> and here I am again. And here they'll be until the last convoy passes into Kuwait. For the men of the 2135, it's just another day at the office. For the thousands of Americans heading south into Kuwait, it's their ticket to safe passage across the desert of southern Iraq. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, The K Crossing. <laughs> We invite you to join in with your views at our online poll. This week we ask about initiatives concerning the violence in Syria. Just visit our website at voanews.com slash me and enter your vote. That's at voanews.com slash me. We want to hear from you. Human Rights Watch released a report today saying Syrian army defectors have named 74 commanders and officials they say are responsible for attacks on unarmed protesters. We discussed the findings with HRW spokesman Joe Stork. It's a report in which we managed to talk to more than 60 uh, defectors from the armed uh, forces, the army, the sec different security services that have been involved in the crackdown in Syria. And uh, they described in, we've got their testimonies about what went on and the orders they received that have been, you know, basically uh, behind the killings of now more than 5,000 people, according to the UN. What kind of stories did they have? Well, uh, for instance, they were, uh, some of them talked about how they had basically standing orders to use any means necessary to you know, get disperse protesters, stop protests. And, you know, for uh, forces that are, only have machine guns with live ammunition, <laughs> you know, they don't have tear gas, they don't have batons, they don't have, a, you know, non-lethal forms of, uh, of crowd control. Uh, that, means, that means killing. That means killing. We have other cases, more than half of the people told us they had actually were in situations where, you know, they were facing unarmed protesters and were told directly at that time, not just, you know, do whatever you have to, they were told to shoot at, at the unarmed protesters. And in many cases, that's why they became defectors. I mean, they weren't going to do that. What do you plan on doing with this information? Well, we're calling uh, in particular on the UN Security Council to use this information along with the other with the atrocities we've been documenting all along, as well as what the U UN, the uh, Commission of Inquiry from the Human Rights Council has documented, uh, we think that this is this constitutes prima facie evidence that should be put before the International Criminal Court. And the only uh, body that can do that is the UN Security Council. Joe Stork, Deputy Director of the Middle East Division of Human Rights Watch. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon told reporters in New York on Wednesday that in the name of humanity, it is time for the international community to act. He said the status quo in Syria cannot go on. A congressional subcommittee panel on Wednesday examined U.S. policy towards Syria, asking what lawmakers can do to help the opposition as the Damascus government crackdown on the Syrian people continues. Some lawmakers question whether the Obama administration should continue to advocate for a peaceful resolution in Syria in the face of widespread violence. VOA Congressional Correspondent Cindy Sane reports from Capitol Hill. Members of the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs, who attended the hearing, echoed calls by President Barack Obama for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to step down and end the nine months of killing, 
detention, and torture of demonstrators. But some lawmakers, including Middle East and South Asia subcommittee chairman, Republican Steve Chabot, who led the hearing, questioned calls by the Obama administration for a peaceful resolution to the uprising in Syria. This puts us in a difficult position insofar as it brings into question whether we would continue to support the opposition if it were to fight back uh, against the regime's brutality. Speaking for the Obama administration, the Special Coordinator for Regional Affairs of the Office of the U.S. Special Envoy for Middle East Peace, Frederick Hoff, said that is what the Damascus government is trying to provoke. It is clear what the strategy of the Assad regime it is. It is to attempt to channel peaceful resistance, which it cannot handle. It has no clue how to handle peaceful resistance. Channel it as best it can in the direction of insurrection, okay? because it believes it knows how to handle insurrection. Hoff said the Obama administration respects the right of the Syrian people to defend themselves in the face of government violence. He said the Syrian opposition is working with the Arab League to plan for a peaceful transition when the current Syrian government is gone. Hoff said the nightmare of repression for the Syrian people might continue for some time, but that it will end. When the regime is gone, the Syrian people can be assured that they will have plenty of help in rebuilding and reforming their state and recovering the honor and dignity squandered by those who have served themselves at Syria's expense. Hoff called on the Syrian opposition to reach out to religious minority groups in the country and assure them that change is coming and that they will be invited to play a central role in that change. Cindy Sane, VOA News on Capitol Hill. As we mentioned Wednesday, Yemen is transitioning towards democracy with a presidential election in February. However, there is only one likely candidate, Vice President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi. That plan is drawing wide support from opposition parties and Yemen's diplomatic partners. They have been pushing for the replacement of President Ali Abdullah Saleh, who recently agreed to end his 33-year rule after months of protests against him. VOA's Mike Lippin spoke about the balloting with several analysts, including London-based Middle East analyst Jenny Hill of Chapman House. The opposition parties and the ruling parties basically came to an agreement over the course of the summer that Hadi would be a suitable consensus candidate. Uh, and they taken that position on the basis that it would be a temporary measure. So Hadi will become a temporary president who oversees uh, some of the more detailed uh, stages of the transition process. If the elections go ahead uh, in February, Hadi will be elected for two years. And during that two-year period, he will oversee a process of consultation where a lot of the reforms that people really want to see in Yemen will be discussed. So that will include uh, changing the current system to empower parliament. So maybe even the president's position will be abolished. And we might see two houses of parliament potentially bringing in a system of proportional representation for voting and possibly even changing the country's constitution to introduce a system of federalism. Now, those, those ideas have been uh, debated for quite some time by members of Yemen's political class, and they are certainly part of the, uh, the arguments that underpin the revolution, that Yemen needs a much more responsive, legitimate political system. People felt, I think, that the 90-day period um, that, that will take us up to the elections in February was far too short to have those kind of discussions. What about the, the protesters, uh, the, the youthful revolution groups who have been uh, camping out in Sana'a for so long and also protesting regularly in Taiz? What do they think about Hadi as being the consensus candidate or maybe even the only candidate uh, in this election? Well, there are some divisions inside the youth movement, uh, but broadly, most people feel really angry and frustrated about the GCC deal because they see... Uh, power really remaining in the hands of the elite, in, in the hands of all the established actors that have been complicit in the political system for so, so many years. And they feel that they were not consulted, that they didn't have a voice in the process. 
and it, it, there's a lot of frustration uh, about the terms of this deal. Do you know if these groups will have the ability to put forward uh, their own candidate for president? As far as I understand it, there would be nothing stopping uh, other groups nominating candidates for the, the presidential election. But the crucial distinction is that Hadi will have the support of the ruling party and all the members of the opposition coalition. Now, that includes Islam, the Islamist party, which is a member of the opposition coalition, but also has a very prominent presence inside Change Square in Sana'a, which is where all the youth activists are camping out. The other problem for the youth activists is the lack of leadership they have themselves inside their own movement. Um, it's a very diverse coalition. Over the course of this year, they have not successfully managed to, to put forward um, a, a single figurehead. There is a process of consolidation and organization taking place inside the youth movement, um, but they, don't, they haven't yet agreed on a single figure who might be able to represent them. The key thing to understand about the, the transition process and Hadi's position as the new president and the appointment of the new prime minister is that power in Yemen has not been fully structured through the government for years prior to this revolution. And that is certainly not going to be fully structured through the government during the transition process, and maybe even not beyond that. Uh, so there are still some very powerful regime players who really do hold cards. They have m military divisions under their control. They have significant financial resources. And they're able to play the patronage game. They're able to buy support for people inside the political system. Some of those regime players are currently divided, and they control different bits of Kana, they control different areas in the country. They've been fighting one another during the course of this the revolution unrest that we've seen this year. So those players will have to reach an, an agreement amongst themselves about how they're going to share power in the new system if we're going to see any process of demilitarization of the army coming out of the streets and an end to the conflict. So the ability of those powerful players to come to some kind of power sharing deal could be even more significant and more important than you know, whatever election process unfolds in the next few months. Is that your opinion? The ability of the regime players to come to agreement amongst themselves, if that's possible, will be more significant than the elections that are due to take place in February. And the challenge for Hadi uh, and for the new prime minister is that they themselves do not have an independent power base. London-based Middle East analyst Jenny Hill of Chapman House. Friday on Middle East Monitor, we plan to bring you the thoughts about Yemen's election from Robert Powell, a Middle East expert at the Economist Intelligence Unit in New York. Jewish human rights organization, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, has launched a new campaign to find and prosecute missing Nazi war criminals while they are still alive. The director of the center, Ephraim Zuroff, told a news conference in Berlin the new operation will offer rewards of up to $32,000 for tips leading to the investigation and capture of war criminals. He says the passage of time in no way diminishes the guilt of the killers. Zeroff said a new legal precedent set by the recent prosecution of former death camp guard John Demyanyuk could pave the way to reopening more criminal cases. This has been VOA's Middle East Monitor. Join us Monday through Friday for news from the region and of interest to the region. Coming up on International Edition, the U.N. Secretary General says the Arab Spring has transformed the geopolitical landscape. Thanks for tuning in to The Voice of America. For more on the stories you've heard on our radio programs, visit our website at voanews.com. That's where you'll find in-depth reports, related stories, videos, and more from our team of correspondents. Or take the news with you 
by downloading podcasts of your favorite VOA program. That's at voanews.com. VOA Online news for a changing world.